No absent with regrets. Any declarations of conflict of interest, anybody? Okay, and you can declare at the time of the agenda item. Um, approval of agenda. Are there any additions or deletions? We're good. Okay. Moved. Second. Oh, Lindsay probably needs this. Okay, moved by Councillor Dare, second by Deputy Mayor. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. We have a presentation today. We have with us CBDC, we have Michelle Amaro. Welcome, Michelle. So I, I think Lindsay probably um, explained the process. You good? Explain the process. Yes. Yep. So just make sure you speak right into the microphone because it's a hard one to... I don't have to press any buttons. It's working already. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Good. All right. So I will work my way through this here. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I, I don't think I've probably, I haven't been here since I've been the executive director since Chris has gone, but I did want to say hi and introduce myself. Um, and again, thanks for having me. So the, the, whole, the, the reason why, uh, and I want to make sure I'm speaking into the mic, one of the main reasons I wanted to reach out today was because I wanted to, uh, I know that you guys are, you've got some new counselors on board and you're out and about speaking with, pe speaking with people in the community and I just wanted you to maybe know a little bit more about our services and pro um, programs that we provide and if, when you're speaking with somebody and they talk about economic development or their business, then perhaps you can think CBDC when you're talking to them. Um, so what is a CBDC? What is a CBDC? Um, we're CBDC Yarmouth, so there's a bunch of them in Nova Scotia, and we are in rural communities. So we're doing economic development and helping out people with small and medium-sized businesses in rural Nova Scotia. So um, there's a bunch of them across Canada, but 13 in Nova Scotia, 41 in, in the Atlantic provinces. And again, we, are, we work within the geographic area of Yarmouth County. Um, our objective's pretty easy. We want to help provide uh, services to help create a better economy in our area. So we do it through a bunch of things. Um, we do business counseling, we have advice, and we do one of our main programs is um, financing. So big one, it's our lending program. I've included a photo here of our staff. Um, we've got five staff. We're located just down on uh, Pier 1, the big blue building down. You probably all can see it from this building here. And I just want to let you know that we're all, the, the staff are very knowledgeable and they're eager to speak with anybody. So um, please, when you're speaking with any of the people in your community, you'll know um, that we're really excited to talk about any of their ventures, any of their business ideas, any of their expansion plans if they're already in business. And um, yeah, just let us, let, letting you all know that all our staff want to see our communities grow and prosper. This here is our tagline, financing, training, advice. So when you think of CBDC and you see our logo, that's the three pillars. And I'm gonna talk about them quickly here in the next couple of slides. As I mentioned, financial assistance or our lending program is, is the bigger piece of what we do. Um, we do loans up, up to $150,000, and they're available to any sector, any size, any business structure. Um, one of the main um, misconceptions, I would say, about what we do is that we only do loans to startups, or we only provide services to startups. And I wanted to let you know today that that is not true. We do loans to uh, existing businesses to help them with expand, expansion sorry, and modernizations. And in this graphic that I've included here today is that I wanted to show you last year that over half of what we did in our loan, um, loan approvals last year was in, in existing businesses. So just a quick, easy way to see what it is we do. And also on this slide, I wanted to show you those two staff who are responsible to pull together loan applications for, for our applicants, and those are Christina and Shane, just so that you have a visual of who they are. Over the last couple months, we've been really busy. I'm gonna say couple, it seems like a couple, but it's been a lot longer than that. <laughs> uh, we've been busy with the Triple RF, our uh, Regional Relief and Recovery Fund, 
monies available to those that weren't able, who've, who've suffered through the pandemic and weren't able to get the, uh, the CEBA loan through the government. So this is something that's still ongoing. We still have funds available. Um, and there's another uh, round, they're calling it round three, but to everyone else, it's, there's still money available. If somebody's still having experiencing troubles, please send them down. It's an online um, application, but for those that are not tech savvy and, and may have some difficulties with that, we would encourage anybody to reach out because we don't want to see anybody left behind. Another one of our programs, a very successful program, is one that we will refer people to if we get the phone call when people are saying, do you offer any grants for startups? And, and our quick answer is usually no. But we have this program called the Self-Employment Benefits Program. And it's, it's a program that allows you to draw employment uh, EI-type benefits for a period of 46 weeks while you start up your business. So you don't have to worry about the bills, you don't have to worry about feeding your family, you can concentrate on the business and the startup procedures and, and it's a really stressful time. So uh, there's training associated with this program as well because we want to see these businesses not only succeed for 46 weeks, we want to see them succeed well into the future. So um, again, Jose Dulong is the staff person that's responsible for that and the application process is a little um, involved, let's use that word. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly reach out to us, have a conversation with Jose. She'll point the person, the, the, the client in the right direction to get on that program. Uh, the th second pillar, training, financing training advice. Big piece of what we do at CBDC Yarmouth is training. So yeah, we've got all kinds of fancy names for it, but at the end of the day, if you need some business management training, in bookkeeping, HR, marketing, social media, any of those types of things, we can find uh, some funds to cover approximately, I'm gonna say approximately, it is 90% of the cost of that training, and the client has to put in 10%, but very effective. Um, we've had real, a lot of success with that, and we've helped many people um, get the training that they need to be successful, again, in the long run when they're operating their business. Now, if that's not what you need, you don't need the training, and you need something more involved, you're struggling, your business isn't doing so well, uh, or you just need to identify a new market because you need to pivot. COVID's come and you need to think about something else. We've got a consulting advisory service where you can hire a consultant to help you do those types of things, and that will cover 75% of the cost of that up to a maximum of $5,000. So um, we really do think that this is a way to help out people not everyone needs financing, but some people can take advantage of these programs for sure. And advice, uh, the last pillar of what we do, of course, these services are available free of charge. Anybody can make an appointment to come down. We do our best to help people through the business planning process. We don't provide, uh, we don't do business plans for people, but we'll help them navigate the process, make referrals when need be. Uh, and push them in the right direction so that they can make the right choices with their business ideas and, or ventures. And finally, where are we located? I already mentioned this, but uh, again, we're down at Pier 1. Um, we are open Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, of course, but we, we have been known to be flexible if need be with clients. <coughs> um, I would suggest that people make an appointment to come down, although our door is open to the public and we do have some COVID protocol. Uh, but yeah, just so you're not disappointed when you come down uh, to meet with somebody, uh, it'd be best to just give a call ahead. And if anybody, any of the counselors wanted to come down and take a look around at our space, if you've never been in and you wanted to do so and just be more familiar with it and meet some of our staff, I would invite you all to come down. Um, again, just put on a mask and, and sign in and we'd, be lo we'd love to see you come through. And if that's all for me today, but uh, if anybody had any questions, I'd love to be able to answer them. Good. Thank you, Michelle. Any questions? Go ahead, Councillor Cleveland. Thank you. Um, actually, first off, congratulations on what you do. You do oh, great work. Thank you. But second off, I'm just curious, how busy is your office these days with everything that's happening with COVID? Is there still a lot of interest? Yep, it's been very busy. Uh, what we saw was that the, the, the RRF or the relief program took over 
for mm -hmm. quite many months. And then we saw it pick up with some regular loan applications. But for a while there was nothing going on. Nobody was kind of, everyone was scared and, and no one really knew what was gonna be in the future. But we have seen a pickup and we've seen some people come in and we certainly are quite busy with that. Triple RF is still very busy and the relief and recovery is still something we're working on right now. Okay, yeah. would, you, would you say that there's a little bit more optimism around now? I would say that I would say that it seems as though it's happening slowly but surely. It, there is there was majorly he, there was a lot of hesitance for quite some time. Um, the summertime made people feel good, but then it, the fall brought us uh, again another another. It was it, there was more hesitance from from people lending sorry from people borrowing money from us lending. But um, but yeah, I see that I see there's a positive there's an optimism. So, yes, definitely. Good. Thank you. Good. Any more questions? Councillor Hatfield? Oh, wait a minute. Councillor McLeod first. <coughs> That's my fault. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Michelle. I think uh, since your inception, I think back in 85, you, you, I've watched a number of people that I know well and a little, and a little um, achieve their goals partly due to your support and uh, I think on, and I think it's wonderful that you're a part of our community and uh, as Councillor Wade has said and uh, I look look forward to your continued involvement in our community Thank so you. again I think it's a great program and as I say I've known a number of clients of yours through the years that, have been, that you've helped. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Hatfield? Yeah, thank you for the presentation. It was really informative. Um, and I'm sure that um, the loans that you give would be very difficult or probably impossible for these people to get from the bank. Um, so I'm just, but I'm just wondering what the interest rates are on, on the loans. Are they equal to a bank loan or? Uh, we, we like to call them competitive. <laughs> um, but of course we do, we're, we're governed by a COA and we do have a interest rate that we need to go with. So we start with prime plus two, and that's where we go from, depending on each situation. Good. Any further questions, anyone? Good, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, staff report, CAO report. Any questions for the CAO? Go ahead, Derek. Uh, Your Worship, I just want to point out the obvious is the report looks a little different yeah, uh, than it has in the past. That is part of the change over to the new uh, e-scribe system. So your senior agenda looks different and, and the CAO report looks different as well. Uh, we're continuing to work through the implementation. Lindsay's leading that. And so you'll see, you'll see more changes in some of, the, some of the stuff as we go forward. But if there are any questions specifically about the content of the report, more than happy to uh, entertain them. Okay. All right. Hearing none. Fire department report. There's nothing attached there, but we're good to go on the fire hall. I think we actually extended an invitation for the fire hall recently. Go ahead. Um, your light yeah. needs your lights off. There, there we go. go. Uh, we extend an invitation uh, next week's um, <coughs> Mariner Center um, strategic planning session on Wednesday evening will be held in the fire hall. I've asked for permission to use that. Uh, so the volunteers are, are working to, to figure that out for us with COVID. Obviously, they can't be open to all kinds of community events at this point because of gathering restrictions but municipal meetings are exempt from those. And so given the number of people that uh, might want to sit in on that session, um, that venue is, uh, is adequately sized, should be able to allow people to physically distance and a pretty good opportunity for us to show it off a little bit. We love it. Good news. Okay, uh, operational services and Chad is here. Does anyone have any questions on that one? Chad, is there anything you need to tell us? You're good? No. Okay. All right, that was easy. Planning and economic development. That's Natalie, and Natalie's there. Any questions for Natalie? 
Kersley had a couple applications for the for the uh, murals. Mm. Okay, let me see who's the light. Okay, Councillor Lesser. Uh, Natalie, I'm wondering, uh, I was contacted by somebody actually lives in the county, but is interested in investing um, in building apartments. And I passed your name on, I'm not sure if that was appropriate or not, but if they, if they don't have, they don't have land in mind or anything, but they just are looking to invest, would coming to you be a starting point? Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Councillor Hatfield? Yeah, it's not, I'm sorry, it's not for Natalie, but I just wanted to go back to have a question for Chad, I, which I kind of missed. So, um, is yeah, that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Is that all right? Yeah, okay. Chad, I just. No it, it's about the um, Water Street, Brown Street um, cross, crosswalk, and I know it's not complete yet, but we did all, I think all the councillors received uh, uh, a letter today from a citizen that was concerned. Um, I think she works in, in that area. And um, one of the issues that she brought up, which I thought was really quite relevant, is that at this time with COVID, we're doing the assessment but is it the right time perhaps for us to be doing that? Because all the, the meetings and the, the training uh, activities that would normally be taken part, pl place at the, the um, at school building there okay. um, are, is not happening. So all that parking across the street and people trying to get across, I say all that, but a p piece of that is not happening. And so um, whether that's a consideration in the in the assessment yeah I, I never really considered that but i hadn't um, either when yeah, she said that i thought yeah, yeah it does make sense right yeah. because you know she says normally there could be at any time 30 40 more cars across the street and people trying to trying to, to cross and yeah. um it, it had some legitimacy to it right yeah agreed and um and so i've reached out to uh, i think one of the initial uh, concerns or complaints came from somebody who either frequents the building or, or works in the building and they have mobility issues. So mm -hmm. um, as far as I understand, the YAIC owns the building and they also own a parking lot um, to the south of the building and they provide 80 parking spots for the, for the building occupants. And so I've reached out to um, the manager of the YAC to see if they regulate the parking in that parking lot or, or if the if the Tri-County Regional Educational Center does, um, because I guess what I would recommend um, prior to uh, installing a crosswalk is to see if, if some of the parking spots in the parking lot could be reserved for maybe accessibility or persons right. with uh, mobility issues. Okay. Um, you may think I'm opposed to putting in crosswalks. That's that's not my mandate. Yeah, I just no. I think we just need to, to do this uh, rationally. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And. and um, and that makes sense because one of her other issues, because I think she d it, it does use a wheelchair, was that the, par the handicapped parking is across the street and then she has to get across the yeah. street to, to, yeah. to, her, to her work. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, that there's legitimacy in that, in that concern as well. So, so we're looking at other issues and perhaps she can take some hope with from, from that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Good, any more questions for Chad? <clears throat> Good. Okay, and Natalie was up, but do we, do we have any more questions for Natalie? Okay, we're good. Engineering, Mark Brophy is here as well. I can see the top of his head over there. Everything's going well there, Mark. Any questions? No? Finance department. Jerry's here as well. Jerry, did you need to share something with us? Sure. Show us the money. <laughs> yeah, so just a couple comments on what was provided in the report. Um, with the town statement to the end of January, just a word of caution, it does show that we're trending a little bit better than budget, uh, but that includes 
the $400,000 payment we got for COVID restart uh, from the provincial government. And also, if you compare it to last year, we were a little higher last year than we are in the current year. And last year, we ended up with a small deficit. So uh, what happens with the town's finances is there's very little revenue coming in in February and March, but we still have all of our expenses going out. So it takes a fair bit of uh, money, I guess, to operate in a month to month. And depending on weather and those types of things and maintenance and breakages, that all determines how we end up. Uh, on the water utility statement, uh, just a quick note, it shows that you know we're below budget, but that uh, has to do with the capital out of revenue line, and we've just spent a fair bit of money there, but that uh, that's a, basically an accounting entry at year end with the auditors that uh, kind of tweaks that uh, capital line into the capital budget or into the capital fund out of the operating fund, so still fairly, feel for pretty good about the water utility statements as well. The last one was just done on the capital projects, and I just thought that was of interest uh, for council to let you know that uh, to the end, of, well, up to February 22nd, when I did the report up, uh, we'd spent just under $11 million in capital in the current year. So uh, just to put that into perspective, as, as I know there's some big projects were being discussed, uh, the town has spent $11 million this year so far. How much, and, 11? Just under 11 million so far, so we'll be over 11 million dollars spent on capital this year by the time March ends. That's awesome. And something that just came through as an email, and you guys are familiar with it, is the fiscal uh, financial condition indexes from the province. Uh, it's a draft at this point, uh, but I have a draft, uh, so looks all right. We're down to three yellows and, and one red. That's what people kind of know Which means know we're probably by. just about perfect. Which means we're pretty good, yeah. Yeah, so they'll be finalized within the next couple of weeks and they'll come up to the council as well and, and be published on the provincial sites. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor. Well, just a quick question. On, on sales of services, um, I see that the, the actual amount is more than three times the budgeted amount. I'm just wondering what services you're selling that... <laughs> <laughs> That have that kind of profit margin. Got to do what you got to do. It's not difficult. <laughs> Bake sales and oh dear. <laughs> yeah, it could be that, but it's not. Uh, Excuse me. I got it right here. So in sales of services, we typically have, um, it's, well, there's some, that's not it, that's not what you're looking for. I'll have to get back to you on what that line was. I did have a note on it, but I didn't bring that note with me. No, that's fine. Thank you. No, I'll, I'll wait email to hear that note to you. No, no, that's down and below a different line. Sorry Thank you. Good. Go ahead, Councillor again. Jerry, the only question I had with regard to your fiscal uh, 2020 20 and 21 projects uh, of 10 million 274, um, is that all our money or is that shared money too? That's no, that's shared. We get we get grants. I mean, yeah. that includes the ferry terminal, which is a big one. Yeah. No, I, I thought that it would be. I was just wanted to ask the question. But, like, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. That's where most of the funding came in. We we did the fire hall, uh, which is the number one there. Mm -hmm. We did that on our own. Uh, we did Glebe Street, which was twelve on our own, and you know the Main Street as well. So, uh, pretty much the, yeah, there wasn't much funding other than the ferry terminal, a few projects of fifty thousand and hundred thousand, but that was the big one. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much, Jerry. I'd like, I'd like that report, actually. Okay. Any more questions for Jerry? We good? All righty. In Yarmouth Recreation, Frank is here. So, Frank, we have to get our... Is tomorrow noon the deadline for volunteers? <coughs> yes.
Yes, uh, we've been canvassing local uh, community organizations and the community at large for nominations. Deadline is tomorrow at noon. And then we put our recreation committee to work looking at all the submissions and voting on top three picks because Monday at 4.30 we have to submit our volunteer representative of the year to uh, the provincial uh, volunteer organization and that those two people that represent the town and municipality will be part of provincial volunteer celebrations. Gotcha. I got one on my computer ready to go, but it's just, I don't know. So if, if you're thinking of a deserved volunteer out there, it's, you can just drop me or Gail an email. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, a, a long bio, a few words about their volunteerism, and, okay. and we'll take care of the rest. Thank you. Go ahead, Deb. Yeah. Well, just wanted to highlight um, on your report that Gail Muse will be retiring after 41 years, and um, I, I can't even imagine your department without her, honestly. I, I mean, I, I think the first time I called Gail was like 38, seven years ago, <laughs> and, and called her many times in between. So please extend my, at least my heartfelt congratulations on her retirement, and I'm sure I speak for everyone. Um, she's, she was always a, like so pleasant to deal with, and uh, she'll be missed. Thank you. Uh, I definitely will extend those uh, compliments towards Gail. And I'm hoping if uh, COVID gathering restrictions permit that during the month of March, and I can say this because I've already uh, let Gail know that uh, during the month of March, we are planning on having Gail days on Fridays in March, wow. her last month. So awesome. if COVID permits, I definitely <laughs> will be extending invites uh, or maybe we'll have something right here at Town Hall to, I don't like to say that, but embarrass her a little bit, just to, <laughs> to tell her how much she's appreciated. Oh, I love it. Go ahead there, Deputy. To echo what Councillor Dare says, um, as a former president of the Co-Ed Softball League, I can say that Gail goes above and beyond any time you call to book you in for a field or fit you in where you can, so she definitely will be missed, I'm sure. Uh, but just a follow-up question on our uh, January 14th meeting, we. Um, we said to look into uh, Frisbee golf, and you said you had already were in contact or whatnot with Ben, and I'm just wondering how that's going, if there's anything, an update on that at all. Uh, just a couple updates. Uh, initially, we were just looking at getting some, uh, uh, a very small amount of uh, baskets, which in Frisbee golf is basically the hole. Um, so we are going to get six baskets, uh, two uh, Frisbee kits, and our plan this spring and summer um, is to designate some, some areas around the community to try them out, um, have the, the Frisbees in a lockbox. So all they have to do is send me a text and I send, if someone wants to play, then I send them the code to unlock the box and they can play. And then hopefully the Frisbees will go back in the box, locked for the next person. So instead of three, we're, we're ordering six and depending on uh, and I'm assuming it's going to be very well received. Um, that may start plans moving forward to a permanent, uh, at least a nine basket or a nine hole course. Um, and one thing that I was thinking of, and I've, I've had a very brief conversation with our manager at the golf course. Um, <coughs> in some places in North America partner Frisbee golf with regular golf. So that may be an option as well to maybe just take a week or two and test it out right at the golf course. So instead, you know, instead of uh, yelling four and a golf ball's coming, it could be yelling four and a Frisbee's coming at you. <laughs> oh gosh, anything else for Frank? We're good? Thanks, Frank. Okay, business, tire recycling facility report, Reese. <laughs> Your Worship, um, I just wanted to comment that uh, I felt it worthy to have Reese come and, and present what he found. Uh, he did such an outstanding job in putting, putting this report together. I thought just to hand you the report and say, there it is, is it wouldn't do it justice. So. 
if, if uh, I think you'll understand if you've read the report that uh, he's put a lot of work into this. And uh, oh, I can see that. It's <laughs> yeah, high quality. You guys can hear me okay? Everything's good? Sure. Okay. You can see everything? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I thought I would just uh, do a presentation trying to give an update and give an overview of what I submitted for the tire, uh, tire recycling facility report. Um, so uh, planning staff recommended by council looked into and investigated uh, for the opportunity of uh, putting a tire recycling facility uh, for the county of Yarmouth and serving uh, areas around there. Namely, looking into what is, uh, understand what is needed in order to uh, put in the facility, uh, what the process of implementing one would be, understanding the concerns, benefits, and feasibility of uh, putting in a facility. And so the potential location in question was the Yarmouth County Solid Waste Park located in South Ohio. So the report, oh, there we go. So the report uh, goes into some background information of what um, exists uh, with tire recycling facilities in Nova Scotia. Uh, currently there are two. Uh, the first one is in uh, Halifax C&D Recycling just outside of Halifax. Um, the facility size is about 5.5 acres and uh, tires are brought to the facility and they are shredded and recycled into tire derived aggregate which is used for um, multiple engineering uh, operations projects across Nova Scotia. Uh, with consultation between uh, stakeholders and uh, professionals in North America and the <coughs> province when it was constructed in 2009, this was found to be the most sustainable, environmentally sound and economic, op economic option for recycling tires. The second one that exists is uh, Lafarge uh, Brookfield Cement Plant, which is located in Colchester County. So this uh, facility recycles used tires into low carbon fuel um, as an alternative to using traditional uh, fossil fuels. So tire recycling process um, is done through a program through Divert Nova Scotia with a non-for-profit non -profit group uh, through the province. Uh, so the provincial program is, uh, was established in 1990 I believe, um, to remove and ban used tires from landfills and property recycle, uh, properly recycle them. Um, so this program requires registration uh, for tire retailers and salvage, uh, salvage, sorry, salvage yards to re register with uh, Divert Nova Scotia. So when they register, uh, people can drop off their used tires to the salvage yards and tire, tire retailers um, where they are temporarily stored. Um, Divert Nova Scotia and the province then hires contractors to pick up the used tires from these retailers to take them to Nova Scotia's uh, two tire recycling facilities, um, as aforementioned. Uh, currently, there are two contractors that are hired uh, for a five-year contract uh, to service um, sections of the province, which are located below um, in the icon. Sorry if it's a little small for you guys to see. Um, in terms of planning feasibility, so this is an aerial view of Yarmouth County Solid Waste Park. Uh, currently, looking at uh, the aerial view, there seems to be sufficient space in order uh, to possibly uh, put in a tire recycling facility. I just thought I would show just the surrounding areas too that um, these surrounding three parcels are also town owned, so if there is, needs to be more room to facilitate an area, um, there's that possibility of extending into those other parcels as well. 
Um, so these lands are located in uh, the municipality, so Modi would have to be involved also in the process if we were to uh, facilitate or put in um, a facility. Um, and when they're implemented, it requires a minister approval from the Minister of Environment, and it has to go through an environmental assessment process as well with the province. So planning staff had a discussion with uh, Divert Nova Scotia and uh, currently their response was they have more than enough capacity and capability to handle, um, uh, to handle uh, demand and to service and process used tires in the province um, as is. Presently they're engaged in a five year contract with two uh, tire hauler uh, contractors. Um, this being said, staff recommend that um, there's neither the economic feasibility or overall demand presently to implement the tire recycling facility uh, currently or presently for the region or within um, the tire recycling, uh, recycling program with Divert Nova Scotia. Uh, with next steps and recommendations, planning staff recommend two options for council. So one would be to advocate for staff to continue dialogue with Divert Nova Scotia and determine uh, when a new tire facility, recycling facility could be needed uh, depending on demand and how we, how we can be included in that process in the future. And the other option, uh, which I mean we could do two options as well, or uh, these, do these two options, was uh, to investigate other avenues of development opportunities or contact further or conduct further research into what the best land use would be within the Yarmouth uh, County Solid Waste Park or industrial land that could be more effectively uh, generate revenue. Um, that is to say that uh, Divert Nova Scotia also within their program provides funding uh, for other development opportunities for recycling as well. So we could look into other options. And that is all. Thank you. Councillor Lesser. Uh, thank you, Reese, for that report. I think when we brought it up, we were looking kind of for a yes or no. Um, and I. I, can't, I couldn't believe when I saw the report and how much work you put into it. Oh, thank you. Um, and I actually was expecting just a simple no and that we wouldn't possibly be even in a position that we might be able to do it down the road. Uh, but I do understand that if they already have facilities built, it probably is going to mean that the cost for us to do it will be much higher when there's already places doing it. Definitely. Um, but I do like the idea that you said about looking into other things that we can do. Um, and yeah, the report is incredible, so thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Councillor Dares? Yeah, <clears throat> I'd like to second that as far as the detail in the report. I, I had no idea how much I didn't know. Um, <laughs> but um, just curious about the, the uh, re added value added research and development uh, opportunities. Would the Resource Recovery Fund Board be already participating in that type of an activity or? Sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry about that. I, I, didn't hear. Oh, no. So the, um, you had mentioned on the, on the next steps, um, investigate value added research and development opportunities. Right. And I'm wondering, would the Resource Recovery Fund Board already be doing that work or is that something you, you'd be doing over and above that? Um, that's a good question. I think that's something that we'd probably have to look into more. Um, I know Natalie had a discussion with, um, with Divert Nova Scotia uh, about those opportunities. Um, and, you know, depending on what council wants to do and what planning staff feels is right, uh, we could look into more of that opportunity. Um, so with that and that question, I don't know if I really have an answer for that right okay. now. But I think, it's, I think it's something to really look into. Um, and seeing where those possibilities lie and how we could use that land or mm -hmm. um, space within no. the... Sounds like there might park. be some exciting opportunity there, so thank you. Absolutely. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Dean. Sorry, I should have added this in the first place. Um, during the election, Mark Hubbard, who was running, came up with a really good idea for, um, for a green economy in, in, Nova Scotia, or in Yarmouth. Uh, and his idea was to try to look at building a solar park. So instead of having solar panels on your house um, and everybody, like when you sell your house, the solar panels go with it. It takes maybe 20 years to get them paid off, but instead you would buy uh, in a share of a solar farm. Um, and I thought the idea was good. And I don't know if with a new premier that's quite interested in environmental um, sustainability, I don't know if there's any possibility with that land there or even the old the old um, landfill site I'm not sure what's being used there but I don't know if there's any possibility to look at I basically it would work out that 
what I looked into, it sounds like it would be about $1,000 per panel and that you would buy whatever amount of panels you want and you would get a percentage of the money back that you could apply towards your electricity, but you wouldn't have to have them on your house uh, and then worry about trying to sell them. But I'm not telling you to go look into that because <laughs> uh, I know the amount of time it takes to do a report, but something that, you know, if, if the opportunity comes up and when we get our grant uh, person hired, that might be something we could explore as well. Yeah, absolutely. Councillor Hatfield. Um, thank you, Reese. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I was like, Gil, I didn't know how, how much I didn't know. And I did read it all. So um, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering what the other possibilities would be, we, you know, when you're looking, when you've been out looking around, what kinds of things you've seen that other places are doing to you that would be things for us to look at? Um, as of now, I, I, I can't really say I can, you know, bring something on the top of my head uh, type of thing, but um, I, like, I just, thinking from my, you know, point of view and my background in environmental sciences, and, you know, it's been a long while <laughs> since I graduated from that, but I think it would be worthwhile maybe exploring that and see really what's out there, but, yeah. Go ahead, CAL. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on the on the suggestion around around solar or solar farm. Um, so every now and then, uh, Nova Scotia Power puts out, as they did fairly recently, a bid opportunity for municipalities or other public sector entities to to bid to provide uh, solar energy to the grid. And so we, we actually have a solar um, installation out at the waste park. It's on the roof of the compost facility. And, and so we sell power to Nova Scotia Power. We get a, a monthly, monthly check, Jerry, on that. We also have uh, solar installations on the Public Works building and on the Anthony Pavilion at the, um, at the uh, Mariner Center. Future uh, possibilities would include a ground-based installation at the former uh, uh, landfill site because that land has very little use possibility. Um, the, the fire hall, we stepped away from that because the roof was going to have to be replaced within, say, five years or so. It wasn't worth giving up five years of life on the roof and doing it right away, so we went to the Mariner Center. So we have other opportunities. The key reason, I guess, why the landfill didn't get, a couple reasons why the landfill didn't get considered in the last couple of rounds is, is there is a building up there. That was a requirement of the bid process is that there, was, there had to be a building on site. There is a very small building there, but uh, the fellow who, who we had engaged to look at the feasibility of the different options uh, stepped away from that one. The other issue that we have is that we do actually have a a, a user of that site currently, and a large solar farm might displace that user. It's the um, the uh, remote control flying club. So if you look um, in Reese's report, there's an aerial shot, and you can kind of see the grass runways that they have <coughs> on the old landfill. So uh, they they use and they enjoy that location, and and any consideration of a solar farm, you know, would potentially displace that activity. Not that that's the be all to end all, but it is a consideration. Uh, in the future for that. So, um, you know, we, we have looked at solar and wind opportunities when, when they've been available to us and, and we'll continue to do that. If there was ever an opportunity to do something large scale and get a favorable or reasonable rate from Nova Scotia Power for the effort to make the play, payback reasonable, you know, that for, former landfill sites are, are uh, a good location generally because they have little other land use possibility. Good. Any more questions for Reese? Thanks for that. That was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you we very much. We are all so much smarter right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bus shelters. I guess I put that on. So, um, Chad, that might be for you. And I think it was just a question around... Um, we were going to put one in Alma Square, and I had a lady that was so excited about that, and then we had a very short email exchange about other bus shelters at around $12,000 each. So I just didn't know where we were on the Alma Square one. <laughs> I guess I should have read the agenda. 
<laughs> What's that? I guess I should have read the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, if you recall, a few years ago, bus shelters was sort of on our list uh, to do, but um, that got put aside by the second bus, I believe. Um, but we did do a little investigating into cost, and we we picked a few locations. Um, Alma Square was one, the Royal Bank, and I think the Red and White. Um, there's some land issues there. I think we need to, we can't necessarily fit the bus shelters within the street right away, so... I think a few, a few years ago, I, I talked to um, the Royal Bank, and I think it was Ralph Burrell at the Red and White to, mm -hmm. to get kind of permission to position at least part of the bus shelter on private land, and, and we get the go-ahead. But um, to answer your question, um, you're right. Uh, the price is about ten to twelve thousand dollars. The footprint for the uh, bus shelters is about six by ten feet. Um, we had a design. I think when Caroline was here, she found a few designs. Um, but no, there's nothing in the works, if that's what no, the question is. that's okay. Is that's what I wanted to know, yeah. if there was something in Alma Square. That's why I... And, um, and we're getting... Aren't we getting bus shelters by default with the... With the streetscape? Madden, with the streetscapes? Yep. Yep. Yes. Alma Square. Alma Square that, yeah. Maybe that was it. Okay, yep. I just wanted to know if that was where we were. Okay, yep. good. That's all, that's all I had. Anybody get any questions on that one? We're good? Okay, but don't sit down yet. The next one is <coughs> ceremonial flagpole. So, CAOU, did you put this on? Your Worship, it was raised uh, back in September that uh, the flagpole out front of Town Hall and Frost Park often gets used for uh, ceremonial flags, flags that you get asked, Your Worship, to fly for different uh, different causes, um, different to bring attention to different issues, mm -hmm. social issues primarily that uh, that uh, some of our citizens uh, feel very dear very uh, close to and, and concerned about and so and it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think the question was couldn't we have a separate flagpole for that? And uh, I asked Todd to take the uh, take the motion which was to investigate a second flagpole. He provided a few options for council's consideration, and I've included pictures of those options. The first one was uh, the Killam Wharf flagpole, and there are seven flag positions on that pole, and in the picture I've included, there is, in fact, one of those flags flying. It's the Communities in Bloom flag. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second option was the flagpole on Water Street, which you can see down below the, uh, the compass um, look off. Uh, that flagpole has one position, but it does have a T configuration, but it has one flag uh, capacity. And then, of course, uh, there is the possibility that we could purchase an additional uh, flagpole. Uh, he got prices from four to six thousand dollars, depending on what you're looking for. And uh, if you were looking for a location, uh, Todd felt that uh, Sealand Landers Park would be enhanced by a flagpole, and so I included a picture of of a section of that park where a flagpole might be installed. So those are some of the <coughs> options. The m motion was to investigate. That's the investigation. So we, we need direction from council if we're going to proceed with anything. Okay. So uh, I'll just say what I'm thinking and then everybody can. <laughs> I, I personally like the option on the waterfront because there is one there. And... Um, I guess I wasn't even the mayor for a month. That's like eight years ago. And you said the flagpole is under the mayor's discretion. And um, you wouldn't believe some of the groups that asked, well, <laughs> you just can't fly those in Canada, folks. <laughs> so it's, it's really difficult. And it's not, a personal, it's not a personal choice. It's just what's appropriate to us as citizens. Um, so very recently, um, we had a request to fly a flag, which turned into a press release that you will do it and we'll meet you here at a certain time on a certain day. Um, we hadn't said we would do that at all. Um, this past week I've had religious groups come in. I've had like it just so, so it's, it's really difficult because when you, you say yes to one and then and then uh, I'm just being wide open with it uh, you, you say yes to one and then you know the I need it to go up for the whole month and then you get 
you know, other groups that say I want it for a day or a week and why is it, it's like people, it's a, it's a flag and, and we're trying to celebrate everybody. We're trying to give everybody time, but if that's what that flagpole is gonna turn into, then I would much rather do it on the water. There's a, it, the waterfront's perfect. It's got the Acadian flag, First Nations, Nova Scotia, Yarmouth, it's got everything, American flag. It's got everything there, so that would be my choice. And just take, and I hate to do that because it's working until you, until you have people that think it's okay to force you into. Go ahead, so Yale. So your worship, this you aren't the first mayor to encounter this problem, um, of right? Of conflicting open. desires and and expectations around flying <laughs> flags on municipal property. Um, some municipalities have addressed this through creating a flag policy uh, that lays out the, to, to people who want to fly a flag what our rules would be if you want to have your flag flown on a municipal pole. Um, we can take a crack at investigating what other communities have done in that regard and uh, you know, bring that back for your consideration in addition to your consideration of what pole you might use to fly these flags. I guess. What I'm suggesting is if there were some standardized rules, it might manage expectations a little bit. That's, that's helpful. I, I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with the flags. I have a problem with the, the demand and the, you know, I want my time. It's, it's, it's really hard. Sorry, Councillor, go ahead. No, it's, it's just um, rather timely. I just received a request um, to pass on to you this week from a service club asking us to uh, recognize uh, their International Day, and they'd like to fly the flag. And uh, so it is timely. Um, I, I think the problem with having it on a flagpole with seven flags is that it would get lost in the mix. And so yeah. there's unlikely that there would be much recognition. Um, and I know that the biggest headache I had at the Mariner Center was having an nautical oh. flagpole with a gaff. Um, and uh, yeah. I got called by the Prime Minister's office on more than one occasion mm -hmm. because of the, the, uh, the way the flags were flown. Um, but uh, it would be nice to have at least one location, maybe a single pole somewhere, where uh, a flag could be flown for a period of time. And I think um, that's probably the best scenario is to have it a, as a single, single flag pole. Anyway, my suggestion. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor. I like Check. the idea of coming up with a policy and having a protocol and that way it's fair for all. You're not, you know, seen as leaning towards a favoritism towards one group or whatnot. And, you know, it standardizes everything. Uh, I myself, I like the one down below Frost Park. It is the single pole. It is close to town hall, you know, kind of by our celebrated area that's well kept and shown off. So I think that's a good one. But I do think to look into maybe what, maybe we could make a motion or, or whatnot to direct staff to do that and then come back and report and make the, the best call from there to see what other places do or whatnot. But I think having some policy saves a lot of headache for the mayor and other people and for us too, for it not to come back that, you know, why did they get it? Why not? Why a month? Why a day? Because as, as someone who, you know, was proud that the Pan-African flag is out front at the moment, I think it is important to people to, you know, put that on out there for whatever reason. And if we had the policy, I think that would protect us from any foolishness in the future, so. It's, it's, um it's a hard one, because like you said, I mean, you, you're the Pan-African flag, because that's this month, but you raise that and you're so happy to raise it, and then, then the argument's coming, like, why is that up so long? And can I have, I, it's just really disconcerting because it takes away from the intention of celebrating, you know? So um, I'm not, I, I like the policy. Uh, I also have no problem with the one flag, and it could be it could be that one right there off of Frostburg. I guess I'm not I'm just not a fan of thinking you have to put up another. We got money to spend. We don't need to put up another flagpole. We got a ton of them. So that's just you know. Go ahead, there, Councillor. Please. No, thank you, Your Worship. Um, it's timely for me as well because I had someone reach out, and actually, uh, it's it's a little further down on the agenda. The correspondence that was sent. But uh, I agree with, uh, with the deputy mayor um, in a couple of aspects. We get along pretty well. Um, <laughs> and that is that uh, I like the idea of Water Street better. Um, uh, Water Street as in Ross Park. Uh, 
uh, down below. It's a, it's a nice location there. Uh, it's, it's one pole. You have the Canadian flag above and you can raise something underneath and that one thing gets focused on as opposed to getting lost. So I think that's a good idea. I, I do agree that, that there should be a policy in place if there's going to be issues with it. And uh, so I, I certainly would uh, support you know, the, uh, the uh, approach that we tried to get a policy in order. But uh, I like the idea of, of on Frost Park. It's probably easier and it's, you know, you don't want to spend, you're right, you don't want to spend any extra money. But uh, down on uh, that spot on Water Street is a, is a really nice spot. And uh, I think you would get lots of attention on whatever flag may be flying below the Canadian flag there. Oh, we can add to it? The one on Water Street? You can put a flag you can, underneath it. You can put the, a flag underneath. Yeah, the, the pole's been underutilized, actually. I don't recall the last time we threw a flag. Let me see here. Oh, there is, is there? a oh. branch. Like, there's a, there's two of these and one of these. <laughs> says it's a gaff. <laughs> okay, Councillor uh, Hatfield. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say that I agree with, with the other two councillors here that I feel that we already have that one pole there. It's in a prime, prime spot, um, very visible, and I think that would be a great, great place. I don't think we need to, to have another, it would be wonderful to do that, but I don't think we need to spend the money to do that and to have it on the one down on the waterfront, um, I just think it's going to get lost. There's a lot of flags on that on that pole, and um, it's difficult to see the ones that are there. So I think these would would stand out much better in the one in Frost Park. Thank you. Yeah, and we still we still need a policy because we just can't put everybody's flag up. Go ahead. Uh, just one more suggestion, and I've seen this done in, in other places where they actually had like a sign, a, some a sandwich board or some type of sign. We saw excuse me, signage that explained what that particular flag was for. So it's celebrating uh, International Lions Day or celebrating um, Black History Month or whatever, but there was signage along with the flagpole. Um, and that might be an idea that would draw greater attention to the issue. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so you need a motion to direct staff to... If you'd like a policy, yep. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'll just call on yourself since you've had the most experience with dealing with these, these issues day. and we'll, yeah. look at, we'll look at the policies that we can gather from other communities to see what lessons we can learn. All right, good. Thank you. Second by deputy. All those, or any more discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Thank you, folks. Dog park wayfinding signage. So in the report that I provided, uh, staff report, we've identified uh, two locations uh, that could support some uh, directional signage to the dog park. Uh, both of them would be located at the two entrances leading into the park, uh, one on southeast and one on forest. Um, the total cost of that would be $150. How and much? $150. For the two, um, based on the size, that would make sense, and we're using existing material and exi existing staff resources. Um, I did reach out to the chair of the dog park uh, with the map of where they would go and if they had any suggestions, and they were supportive of whatever direction the town would like to take with the signage. Okay. What do you think, Council? Get that done? Okay, moved by Councillor Dares, second by Councillor McLeod. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. That motion was to do those two signs. <laughs> Thank you. Mental health supports, Councillor Lesser. Go ahead. Oh, 
Wait a minute, something's on. Sorry. Just, just sorry, to follow, yeah, sorry about that. Just to follow up to the dog park. I remember at one time they were talking about putting lights there. Um, we had a little issue. Did that light ever get put in or is it, we're still working on that? Uh, the operations manager can answer that. The dog cart, the light, Chad, the light. Um, the light and pole arrived on Monday. Oh, perfect. We're just waiting for the weather conditions to, to, to get better before we can install the concrete base. So it should be, should be in by the end of March. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. There you go, Councillor Lesser. That was good timing, I guess. <laughs> um, I've got a few things here, and I didn't want to cause anybody to have a heart attack this morning when I kind of threw them all out last minute, but um, a few things I guess I'd like to bring up. Uh, nothing really requiring a motion, but just to get us thinking about some of the things we could do and possibly a motion in the future. But the first one on 8E is mental health supports. Uh, I think we all know that our community suffered a lot in the last, well, last few years. Um, we've had a lot of deaths and suicides. Uh, obviously, COVID has taken its toll on people. Uh, and it is here often, it's hard to get mental health supports. And the time it takes to get it is often not the time that the person needs. Um, I don't really know where to go, except it would be nice to see some mental health supports outside of the hospital that um, people could access. And I know when the now Premier came, came here on a tour, he talked about uh, Premier Rankin, well at the time, candidate Rankin, talked about trying to move mental health supports into clinic-based um, facilities and I know we have we operate with the I guess the Industrial Commission one clinic um, and there's a clinic across the street as well and I, I think it might be you know something for us to think about we now have the health minister as our MLA and um, he's also the minister of the newly created mental health and addictions um, along with the mental health supports addictions is something that's probably quite needed they go hand in hand uh, I think a lot of the addictions that we're seeing are coming from mental health or lack of mental health support. Um, working at the high school, we see a lot of students that are self-medicating with uh, street drugs and they could get, you know, if, if it's medication they do need as opposed to just counseling, uh, I think a combination of the two might be good, but if it's medication, there are uh, prescription medications that are more regulated than just using street drugs. Um, so I don't think it necessarily needs, well, it's not, I'm, I'm not asking for a motion, I guess, I'm just. We, can I make a suggestion? Yeah, sure. Um, if you want, don't turn your light out. Um, you can make a motion to direct the mayor to speak with the Minister of Health regarding those very things you said. Okay, I'll take that back. I would like to make a motion then. <laughs> <laughs> I will probably end up with motions for all four of these, but um, yeah, but if, if the mayor would, uh, like, motion if uh, your worship if the mayor would talk to our, our MLA who happens to be the new minister of uh, mental health and addictions and see if there is a way that we can get some mental health clinicians available in the community and maybe the downtown core I know the hospital is sometimes a, a difficult drive for some people that need it uh, and often like at the high school there's students that need it and they can't they can't get to the high school during the day um, and I think the clinic base approach is good. So I guess the motion is if we could ask uh, the mayor to have a conversation with the Minister of Health and to see what supports could be provided. Good. Second by deputy. Any further discussion on this one? No. Questions called. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Contrary? Motion carried. University Satellite Campus. Okay, this is one I'm thinking is probably also not going to require a motion, but we'll see in a few minutes. Um, this is a big one. Uh, I know this started years ago when I was first hired at Yarmouth High School. Uh, Phil DeMille was the principal at the time, and he was a big dream of his was to have um, a Yarmouth University or a satellite campus. And all the way through, including my kids going through high school and thinking, how am I going to afford to get them through university? Uh, luckily, two of them went into nursing, which was local, uh, saved a ton of money and came out debt-free. And then my son did his captain's papers for fishing locally, came out debt-free. 
um, but that doesn't apply to a lot of our residents. A university campus or satellite campus in town would, would do a number of things that would give some hope to some of the students that otherwise might not be thinking of university because of the cost. Um, it would help with brain drain, it would keep people in the community. Um, it would help with innovation, um, trying to get people, uh, like in high school, you could have some of the university professors go into the school and depending on what undergrad would be offered there, it, most likely we already have a bachelor of science program with the with Dow nursing. So it would be like maybe an arts or um, a commerce degree of some sort. And the benefit of the university is um, costs, instead of adding on to, to their space, the costs would be probably feasible. We have enough people in our community that um, have the qualifications to be teaching university courses. Uh, and in fact, they do teach, quite a few people in the community do teach distance ed um, for university. Um, I think overall, it's, a, it's something that when we look at Wolfville and we look at uh, Anaganish and what it does for the economy there when school's in, we're not talking about putting, a, I'm not suggesting like a full campus, but if one of the universities in our province, which we have a lot, would consider putting a satellite campus here more geared towards students that might not be going to university. Um, it, they wouldn't be losing business, they would be getting a market that typically they might not be touching. So I have done a little bit of, uh, I have had a little bit of conversation um, with a few people in government about it. Um, I, one of the first suggestions uh, that was brought to my attention was we should look at University St. Anne. They're uh, the closest university to us. They're a French university, but to see if they could offer some courses in English. Um, I did reach out there and I didn't get a response. Um, so I guess I'm at a, a, a thought, um, my thoughts are, I'm not really sure where to go and how the process in order to see if this is feasible or if the universities might want to consider doing it. Um, and then also to not alienate any of the universities, but to give them all a chance to kind of put a, like put a proposal in of what it could do. Um, it also has the potential to generate some, uh, you know, a bit of a tax base depending on what property they would use to do it. Um, so I'm just, I guess I'm throwing it out there for everybody to think about, is there a possibility that we could explore this further and if anybody has any connections to universities, um, just to, I guess, keep it on the top of our minds that it would be, I think, a, a valuable thing to have for our community, but it's probably years away from happening if it was going to happen. Good. Any discussion on that one? Okay. <coughs> Tanya, I'm a sign attraction. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, Your Worship, seven years ago, uh, this came up at the council table, and I did do some investigation for council at that time. Uh, so perhaps for the benefit of Councillor Lesser and for everybody, I can uh, dig out the, the report that I gave back to council at that time, as well as some of the some of the other re relevant documents, and it might might help mm -hmm. with the thought process. Yeah. I think it will. I was here then. I was here when you did that. Mm -hmm. And um, aside from the information that's in it, I think COVID has turned students here, and that's what's going to be. That's what's going to allow them to study in a university while not incurring the costs. I don't think it. I, I mean, we know that's what's that's what's happening. But the report is re the the information he has is really good. Okay, we good? All right. Tani, I'm a sign attraction. Um, sorry. The, the, I'm thinking of when we go, a number of us have traveled to other places, especially down south, and they have these large signs that are become a tourist attraction with, you know, usually bright colors um, and quite a large sign you get your photo taken in front of. Uh, the closest one that I'm aware of is probably Toronto. And I know it's usually big cities, but you know, in Mexico and um, some of those countries, it's every community has at least one. Um, and I thought, it, I don't know the cost inv involved in building one like these typically are ones that are lit up um, or even a location to put one. But I think it would be like people gather by numbers to get their photo taken to say you were there. The other thing it does is 
they post those on social media, which gets the name of the community out. Um, and it, I think a lot of small towns in, in Canada probably are not doing this, uh, but it's also an opportunity that we could be one of the first to, to do it. One thing I was thinking of is there are people locally that do chainsaw art, um, and is there a possibility of maybe doing like a big wooden one that kind of celebrates some of our culture as well? Um, so once again, it's not a motion. I'm just throwing it out there. If anybody has suggestions of, of a way of getting a nice big sign that people could uh, get pictures taken in front of, but also at a cost that would be minimal, if that, if that possibility exists. I'm looking for, for the impossible, probably. <laughs> Any comments on that one? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think it's a great idea. I'd, I'd love to see something like that at some point. Maybe we can play with it a little bit. But it seems like you could get Yasta involved in something like that, too. Uh, that's just kind of an aside. But I, that could work here. It could work on Frost Park. It could her certainly work on the waterfront. And uh, yeah, it's a good idea. I don't know at all about expenses or anything like that. But if you want to get together and not have a coffee, because I'm not allowed anymore. but. Uh, Usually, usually when I get together with people, it usually involves coffee. But uh, at some point, we'd get together and talk about it and figure out maybe a way that uh, we can do this. Councillor Hatfield. Thank you. Um, yes, I think it, also think it's, it's a great idea, Derek. I think that having been to places in down south, as soon as you get off the cruise ship, the big sign's there and everybody's lining up to get their picture taken, right? And then the next thing it is posted on Facebook and, and whatever, and that's, that's what you see. And I think we need more of those kinds of things or, or statues or whatever that people can go to to get their picture taken. People want to come and they want to get their picture taken with something while they're in the community, right? And, um, and that would be... Um, a great um, item to have to just you know for that and I think it's it's bright I think if you have it painted bright it stands out if it's on the waterfront or in Frost Park or or whatever I don't know if it would fit in Frost Park but I think down on the waterfront area I think it would be lovely so that's a good idea I think it's something we should keep in mind the fiddle in Sydney right like that's it's, it's you don't have to go as far as Toronto it's the fiddle in Sydney the lobster and Shediac that belongs here, but that's okay for Shediac. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and I guess on that as well, people that know me, uh, especially at work, know I can be pretty tight with money. Um, so I, I bring these ideas forward, but I think there are possibilities of getting things done. Uh, and I'd love to go for non-coffee with, with your counselor, Wade, and um, try to figure out a plan, but there may be a sponsor that could look at helping us put this together and um, I'm not I'm not a big fan of spending a ton of taxpayers money for the the novelties but I think it could it could get more people to come to our community um, I guess 88 H is that good to move on to yeah, your worship ahead, yeah. okay so 307 Main Street um, for those that are familiar it's the it's the property right now um, the one closest to uh, will be toots I guess well, yeah. Um, that, that property in the storefront has, it's boarded up. Um, it's got a board going across it and it's got some kind of a dragon or some, something that just doesn't seem to fit in with what we're doing as a community. And we're spending, we have tons of business owners downtown spending a lot of money. Our facade program is matching that money and we're building some amazing properties downtown. But then when you get to that block, we have two nice properties with, um, Iceworks, and they have a nice sign, and that's been fixed up, CIBC, but then the rest of that block doesn't seem to fit. And I don't know if they've ever looked at putting money or an application in for the facade program, but I guess my biggest concern is, can we do something to get that cleaned up so it looks presentable and not have a board going across the window? Okay. So um, <laughs> it's an issue. And we keep saying it's an issue, but I, I don't know. I don't know who can answer. If it's Jeff or Natalie that can answer what the next steps are, because it's just, it's the same. You're right. So, 
it's only water. So the, the property at uh, 305, 307 Main Street, um, we did do a facade rendering. We have been working for the last four years with the property owner. Uh, the property has some work orders uh, for dangerous and for some other items so that we're working weekly, bi-weekly, monthly uh, with the owner. So he understands the seriousness of the situation. Uh, they did have a retail business uh, at the bottom floor that has since been moved to another location that they own. And so they're working inside until they can get uh, additional financing to really start uh, making some um, changes on that building. So it is definitely one of the highest priorities in the, in the planning department, and we are in communication uh, with, with that particular property owner. So unfortunately, um, it's a game of patience and a game of financing that's, that's been causing some of the, the challenges there. Okay, so I have a question. I always ask this question. Is there anything council can do? We don't want to wait another four years. And, um, and the councilor is right. Like people are putting a lot of money into their buildings and people are drawn to the downtown um, and then they walk by that, bluntly put. Yeah, I mean, it's not council right. has actually, you know, we have two incentive programs to help stimulate uh, revitalization of those buildings and that's the facade program and the phased in tax rebate program and that property owner will take advantage of them. Um, I think at this point to just have us go and paint it, that will not do it. There's some significant engineering challenges yes. with that building yep. and it needs to be taken yep. care of first yep. before all of that yep. uh, facade stuff can yep. happen. So that, and I, and I respect that. Yeah. Uh, so that like, that's not another four years waiting for that to be fixed, is it? Uh, I think it will, I think it will show itself this spring. So there is a timeline that we discussed with the property owner with regards to some significant work that needs to be done to the building, specifically the roof. And, um, you know, then it becomes, it's part of the vacant registry. Uh, so that building has to be registered with our vacant registry. Uh, system that's rolling out excellent and we have to work with the plan so I will bring we'll bring those back to council and um, then we will look at remedies but right now um, from what the property owner has told me access to financing for buildings that you cannot get a reasonable assessment for to get the financing is a big issue with some of our downtown businesses that want to uh, renovate but they the assessments that are coming back are lower than the value plus the renovation that's needed. So they're not able to get the financing. So what they're doing is now looking for secondary non-commercial banking financing uh, but, to get some of that money. But you know what? I'm probably speaking for you and I apologize, Councillor. But you don't have to have that in the window. I'm sorry, I can't You, you don't have to have the window looking like that. It doesn't cost anything to hang up white curtains or something like it just yeah I think that's right dirty. I think that's fair so we can go back to the property owner and say these are some of the options that we'd like you to do right now so while you wait until that happens at least it can look a little bit more appealing mm -hmm. in comparison to the buildings beside it thank, thank you. you is that helpful yeah. uh, Deputy. Is this the building that Mr. Boudreaux was here complaining about the roof a little while ago? And if so, is there an update on that? Uh, yes. So the back roof has, uh, the shingling has been completed. Uh, the front part of the roof, uh, the, 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 the building that faces the street, uh, that roof has to have a full repair. So it's not just retarping it. It literally is, you can step into it and fall down to the basement. Uh, so uh, the property owner does have a quote and their intention given that they get the financing is to have that roof redone in late spring. Thank you. Good. Councillor Hatfield? Oh, did you want no, to? No, no, Councillor Hatfield? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, um, agree with her worship that 
you know, I think tourists come to town and they're not looking at the roof, they're not looking at the, the wall that's bulging, what they're looking at are the windows, right? And I think those windows in the way they are boarded up and the stuff that's in them is certainly is not complementary of our, our town and who, and who we are. And it takes very little to do something to the windows. It doesn't have to be an expensive uh, fix at all. It can just be something that, that, that looks better than what it is. And the other window, and I don't know if this is the same building or not, but I think it's next door is the gate one with the gaming people in it. Yeah. Is that the same one yeah. with the gun in the window? Yeah, th that's since moved. Par that's been removed? No, it, that, that business has been removed to another location. Okay. Oh, Relocated, okay. sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, because that was always kind of disconcerting to me when I would walk by to see, to see that in our community. Thank you. Thank you. CAL? Yeah, no, I just wanted to mention that uh, when the roof work was done, uh, Natalie arranged to have, uh, you arranged the drone. Yeah, so we had a drone fly and get photographs of the roof condition and some video, and it's, uh, Mr. Boudreaux shouldn't have to worry about shingles blowing off the front building because it didn't appear there was any left. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's shocking, that, that the roof in the front building. So that does need to get done. And he says it's his intention. Uh, you know, the issue that, that you had on the agenda was the front window. And that is not a big expensive item. Yeah. And it's been like that for years. And, you know, I think clearly, uh, you know, Natalie's department, our staff have had to deal with property owner on many occasions around similar issues. This one is never resolved. And uh, it's, it's quite frustrating. And you know, I, I understand council's frustration. Natalie understands it. Our staff understand it. Um, it's just, it, we, we'd like to be able to take the gentleman at his word that things will get, get better. And I guess if, if you bring this fairly simple item to his attention and it's addressed, then, you know, we can, we can say, well, that's, you know, one step in the right direction. But uh, uh, it's, it's awful that we need to be talking about it when it's so obvious to anybody walking by that the property owner ought to realize you know, what he's presenting to the public there. Go ahead, Councillor. Yeah, uh, thank you, Natalie. And I know it's, uh, I know everybody at the table think, at this table thinks it as well, but just a, a big shout out to our staff. It's, it's incredible that every time we bring these things up and thinking of coming up with new ideas or any of us are coming up with new ideas and finding out the CL is going to actually like on the um, the university satellite campus it's already been looked at um, and this like looking at this one that you're already working on it um, it's incredible the staff that we have in, in town and I'm not sure if you know I'm saying I guess this more for the general public that may be watching but uh, kudos to our, our staff all around for the work that they're they're doing on all these files thank you is there a way that we can give them a timeline for that window to have that to have that fixed up uh, the, the work order does stipulate by the spring okay great great gosh isn't that in two weeks <laughs> okay <laughs> all right that's good Said main request for decision, ground search and rescue letter of support. CEO, did you want to? Yep, I'll, I'll speak to that just very briefly. Uh, council, I think most, if not all, of council had the opportunity to tour the ground search and rescue building in Arcadia. Uh, since that tour and, and since the discussions with, with all the municipal councils on a, on a Zoom call, they have made application to the province. Uh, the deadline is tomorrow for that application and they're looking for letters of support. That's all they're looking for at this point for that phase of the work. So they've got, they're hoping to get a grant from the province that will pick up the, a lot of the roofing cost. They have the resources to cover the balance, but understand there are going to be future phases and not far in the future where they're gonna be looking to the municipal units for for some assistance on, on improving the inside of the building that has been affected by, by the water damage, to deal with the well issue that we all had a chance to, to see, and help them continue to provide the support and the important service they do in the community without the, the stress and the additional burden of, of, uh, of trying to deal with that 
the infrastructure that is, that is uh, in desperate need of, of, of uh, uh, work. So at this point, Your Worship, it's just requesting a letter of support. So if Council, sorry, if Committee of the Whole were to make that recommendation, I would ask you to go into an emergency council meeting immediately afterwards so that we can write the letter and provide it in time for the application. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dares? Yeah, I'd like to make the motion that we uh, provide the letter of support with full knowledge that we will likely be uh, providing funding in phase two. Okay. Deputy? I don't know, I would just like to say I was very surprised when we went out to that tour to see that that is the condition of the building, that the people that we call on when our relatives, our friends are lost to go find them and to think that that's where they work out of. I think we obviously owe it to them. Um, I think a letter's very easily to, to do, but I think the, the part about down the road doing our part, um, hearing kind of what we put in the past or what other puts, put people put in the past or what the provincial government puts in, um, you know yourself, if your relative was, was missing tomorrow, those those guys and girls would be there in two seconds to help. And I really do think we owe it to them. And I posted a few pictures on uh, Facebook just to kind of show from our trip out there. And people couldn't believe it either. So I, I think this is a good first step. And the quicker we can get it rolling to help those guys out there, they do a great job. And, you know, we hope we never have to call on them. But in the last few months, it seems like, you know, it's, it's came to the forefront of how important of the job they do. And uh, I think we owe it to them to do this. So this is an easy one, I think. Thank you. Anything else? Questions called. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion carried. Go ahead. They're going to get you the. <laughs> we think we know what it is, Jim. Thanks for indulging me. Um, I wanted to bring up one item earlier, and I forgot to add it to the agenda. Um, thinking, uh, Jess and Natalie, about our current visitor information center and our at art gallery. And the art gallery this past year was used as um, a tourist bureau, I call it, and the visitor information center was used as a, a place where you could go get your um, your test for your COVID vaccine. I know, I wonder what the government of the day um, has plans for those two buildings. I know that the, thinking about the Tourist Bureau, uh, the VIC, um, I know that if they abandon it, it becomes ours for $1, as I understand it, back in 19, 1865, no, 1965 or whatever. And, uh, and at the art gallery, uh, I'm not sure how supportive they're going to be on a project that I was part of back in the middle 90s, if they're going to keep up with the activity of an art gallery in, in Western Nova Scotia. So I'm, I'm just concerned about that, uh, wondering if we need direction or if I need more information that you people have that I don't have. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Now, just, and just to look into it, if, we, if we're not aware of that, if, because it's not on your radar, then I, then I would ask that we, is it worth looking into? Whatever and, uh, you I think it's worth looking into because I don't want to acquire one more building that we have to look after uh, based on any agreement that we uh, that we agreed to back in 1965 or whenever the tourist fair was built. Gotcha. Okay. I'm sort of understanding, but not fully. So are we asking um, the province to um, commit to continuing to utilize building on 4th Street, is that? I guess my question to to myself, really, uh, I'd like to be involved, I'd like for our town to be involved in the decision, if, if they're going to make a decision, are they going to come to the town and say, 
we're going to leave the building tomorrow and give us one day's notice or are they going to leave the building a year from now and give us a year's notice so if i can just speak on that um, your worship uh, it wasn't that many years ago where they contemplated just that uh, they contemplated um, not having that VIC operate as a VIC and they did have some discussion they didn't just rush in and do it and run um, and they got significant pushback from uh, Mayor Mood and, and, and others and they they didn't pursue that plan any further uh, it doesn't make sense to have an international entry point and not have a visitor information center it might make sense in some other places with, that aren't uh, entry points into the province, uh, but it doesn't make sense, and I think they got the message last time. So if experience is, is any indicator, um, they won't necessarily rush in and do it, that they would consult and try and convince us to, to get on side with the program. Um, sure. You know, that was last time. And I'm just curious as to where the art gallery stands. Uh, yeah, they're building, they're spending or raising uh, well over $100 million to build a new project on the waterfront in Halifax. And, uh, and it's just, you know, and I just wonder what their want, what their plans are for Western Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I don't know how we investigate that, whether, whether it's something that Natalie could do or could begin to look into or, or just thinking out loud. Yeah. 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 That's, and that's all, Your Worship. Uh, just concerned. I don't okay. want to. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay, we've got correspondence here. Judy Rosie. Then we've got the, is this, did you add this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Doug Feven's International Transgender Day of Visibility. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and I apologize, I'm kind of stepping on your toes as we already had this discussion about uh, the fact that uh, raising flags is, is your purview. Um, but I know that uh, uh, Doug, Doug Feven's represents uh, the Yarmouth Pride Collective. And I, I'm fairly sure he's reached out to a few of us counselors. Um, and Wednesday, March 31st, is International Transgender Day of Visibility. And he had made a request, that's what the, uh, the actual uh, correspondence is, um, asking if we could fly their flag. Now, that's completely up to you guys. And it's completely up to you, Your Worship. But I do feel that uh, uh, the transgender population is one that uh, has more violence against them, um, has uh, a lot of bullying, that kind of a situation. So I, I feel it would be, in my humble opinion, would be uh, something that it would be very good to show support of um, in order to, you know, I, we don't have to prove anything to anyone, but uh, to, uh, in our quest for, for proper diversity, that uh, it would be a nice thing to do, at least for that day. Yeah. And I don't disagree with that. I just, I was getting so many requests and some of them overlapping um, and I don't want, I don't want any group or organization or anyone else to think that we put one before the other because this is not raising a flag is not a personal issue. It's not a, it, it's just not. It's you know we need to bring some visibility to some groups, uh, celebrate others. You know I think the girl guide is the girl guide one up now. I don't know. I think I put the girl guide one up for a couple days. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I have no problem raising it. It might not be at this one out front here this time, but it would be on Water Street probably, which That's is just yeah. as. Sorry, yeah. I, I apologize. No, I was okay. going to suggest I, I think that it would be a good time to yeah. start using yeah. down there, yeah. and I, I think it would become, mm -hmm. if if you know that there's a flag that's there, that uh, is something we're flying for a particular reason. I think it would uh, become kind of a regular thing for people to kind of drive by and say, okay, what flag is flying this time? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a kind of a nice idea, yep. if, if it's okay with council and with you. Yeah, it's okay with me. Does anybody disagree? You okay with that? All right, so we will, I'll just let you know, I think it's the 31st. Yeah, 
and I'll, uh, I'm in the middle of sending Doug actually a note just to explain why we're right. It has nothing to do with their group. Just it's a, it's a hard one when you get three or four in one day that want the same poll. So we'll get that one up. Okay. Hang on here. Uh, want to do set read the coldest night of the year. Okay. So, so, um, they do that to support shift and the women's housing, uh, women's uh, center. And I think we sent five, we sent $500, which I said could come out of the, why did they come out of Jerry? Came out of the mayor's fund. Where else would it have come out of if the council had given permission? Okay. So, so we'll just leave it at that. We can leave it out of the mayor's fund. That's, that's fine. I overspend by $250. <laughs> it's all good. All right, so that one's done. Uh, Mayor Center Expansion Committee in 375 Maine. Is that UCAL? Well, I guess. Um, I guess. Uh, the Mayor Center Expansion uh, Committee had recommended to the three councils the well, the recommendation is in the uh, is in the memo, but I'll read it to you. Uh, it was moved by Deputy Warden Trevor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Gildares, to recommend to all three councils that 275 Main Street, Yarmouth, be pursued as the option for aquatics and other community recreation programming as a bridge to the expansion at Mariner Center. And so, Your Worship, we already have a motion of council to that effect, uh, including a, a financial commitment and. As an update to all of council, if you weren't aware, uh, last evening uh, the municipality of Yarmouth uh, made a very similar motion. They confirmed their support, uh, their initial investment at the same level as Argyle and the town of Yarmouth, and their support to look into the viability of 275 Main Street as, as a bridge of service to the, to the Mariner Center expansion. So it appears we're off to the races. Uh, to, to begin the real work, uh, which is to figure out how the heck we do that and do that as quickly as possible so that we can return service to the community. Okay, so you, you are having, is there, a, uh, is there another bridge committee soon? So I've requested uh, today, because the motion was made last evening, I watched the meeting a um, uh, half hour after it happened. Um, I saw what was said. I asked today for a copy of the motion, just to have it, uh, so that then I would ask the chairman of the committee, Guy Surrett, to schedule uh, or to agree to schedule a meeting of the bridge committee, and we'll begin the work uh, of all that needs to be done to to get the facility reopened. Okay. Good. Go ahead, Jim. Um, just to uh, update. Jeff, on, on perhaps a lack of knowledge on my part. So if the three councils are committing uh, $75,000 each to open, reopen 275 Main Street as a rec recreation center, uh, we'll probably spend most of that money, will we, on, uh, on improvement of the infrastructure to meet today's standards? And then I al also wonder out loud, um, so we start, <clears throat> we have to hire staff, we have to train staff, we have, and then, and then we have to operate the building uh, over and above the infrastructure upgrade. Uh, do we, who pays for that and how do we pay for that? Do we, uh, do the three units pay? And uh, based on what you and I have suggested over the past three years, based on infra infrastructure and uh, population and things like that. So. I'm just curious if we open the building, who's responsible for running it after that? So that's really the first, Your Worship, if I may, that's really the first question, um, is who is going, who's going to do this? How do you want to approach, how do you want to approach reopening that building? The YMCA closed, dissolved, you know, left the building in, in pretty good uh, shape as far as having cleaned it out and, uh, and left it with us. Um, to reopen it uh, is going to require um, you know, someone's going to have an organization. It's going to have to happen under an organization. 
There's gonna have to be staff management. There's gonna have to be a plan around you know, what are we gonna offer for programs? What is our what is our fee structure look like? What's our, do we have a membership structure? What's that look like? A lot of decisions will need to be made, and my suggestion would be, and it will be to the committee, is that um, you know once they decide the model that they want to to pursue, is that some of the money will be spent on figuring that all that out and creating a business plan that will come back, because I suspect that the two hundred and $25,000 that's been committed as an initial investment, um, I, I don't even know if that'll be enough to get you a year of operation, given COVID-19, given what we know, given that there are, there are some maintenance things that need to be um, uh, dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the first part is understanding how it will happen, how it could happen, and what it would cost. And then the three councils, I think, have another decision at that point because the initial investment is, is really to figure it out. Um, it's not gonna take all that money to figure it out, but you're gonna, you're gonna have to make, a, a, I think, a larger commitment, if I'm guessing, a larger commitment in order to, to give a green light to go forward. So it's, it's, there's a process and there's gonna be some costs incurred and at some point there'll be another decision, a confirming decision, we hope, from everybody to move forward and then I think you're hiring staff and you're doing some of the tile grouting or other work that needs to be done in the building to get it, to get it going. Um, so that's, that's what I believe, but there's lots of discussion that needs to happen. Um, decisions that I certainly won't be making, but you have an, a, a bridge committee uh, under the Mariner Center Expansion Committee and three councils. And so that's, that's one of the questions there is how do we make an efficient thing happen here when we have three levels of decision making uh, to get to to get to a single decision. So maybe we can streamline that a bit. Um, that's a discussion for the bridge committee uh, as soon as we can have a meeting to get together. So I guess when I, when I, I was happy to see the contributions from the other two, our two system municipalities, but I wondered what they were when they were making that or made that decision and passed it unanim unanimously uh, what they were did they think about what we we're talking about just now yeah I, I i can tell you um that i had some discussion in terms of posing these sorts of questions uh think or pointing out these things that we don't know and need to be figured out i did have some some uh guy surat from argyle did reach out to me prior to them making a decision and I shared that kind of, this is some of the work we need to do. Um, nobody reached out from, from Modi and asked me you know, those, anything about the reopening other than through the bridge committee itself. Mm -hmm. right, we talked about it at the bridge committee a week or so ago. And so finally, uh, for the last several years when we, we chat informally, you and I, I've talked about uh, marrying the activity of Yarmouth Recreation and the Mariner Center and the activity, the recreational activity at 275 Main Street so that uh, there would be, everybody would have a, you know, a say in what goes and what, how it could or should go. And so I'll just leave that with you. Yep. And is yep. it my dull monotone voice that messes up the mic here? Is it your what, sorry? dull monotone voice I messes no, up the mic no no it's not the monotone voice um, so I can I can respond to that just quickly if, sure. if um, uh, Frank is is with us and Frank is enjoying a, a, uh, a beginning a good relationship with the RAM and starting to uh, work with him on some programming things so I think that's that's positive uh, how much further things will go with the Armouth recreation or Argyle recreation in terms of the programming aspect of Mariner Center or the YMC, former YMCA, you know, I don't know. Nobody's really gotten into that detail yet because we've been, are we even interested in, in 275 Main? So, um, so there's possibility. Uh, there's possibility that Mariner Center will have involvement uh, with, with the reopening of 275 Main Street. I've, I've personally always maintained that I, I prefer a model that has one management um, ultimately, at Mariner Center, managing all of the 
all of the infrastructure and allowing for the coordination of programming and services that doesn't have to cross ac across organizational boundaries and, and politics. So, um, you know, hopefully, you know, that's one that will get considered in, in the mix, but that's, that's yet to come. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Good. Anything else on that one, folks? No additions. Any in camera? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just like to say on Tuesday, the town released their uh, African here second act yeah. uh, African Heritage Month uh, celebration. It was virtual this year, and um, uh, we talked. Uh, we worked with Sean Doucet from Wing Bean Productions, and uh, he was great. Very easy to work with. Uh, shout out to Mike Carter too for helping out in what he did, and um, the Yarmouth County Museum, Tootsie Heeman, um, Sharon Robar Johnson, and most importantly our students and student support workers. So I think that went over really great. I've got a lot of uh, good reviews back, and uh, thank you to the uh, Department of African uh, Nova Scotian Affairs for um, throwing in some money and uh, helping us to be able to contract out to be able to get that done. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for flying the flag out front as well. I know the students really appreciated that and today I got to go deliver some certificates that thanked all of our students for participating and I got some great messages from parents or whatnot so just a great overall thing so thank you very much. Good stuff. I, I have to say my favorite part of this is the kids. Like they walked up to that flagpole, they were just about shaking, they were so excited. And they want to be a part of it, and they read, and they, like, it was just, it's just really cool. Really, really cool. And it's funny, because I was telling Steve today that, um, the, one of the things Mom said when she did those paint, she said a few things when she did that painting series, but she said, I just want, I want the kids to know that you can be anything you want to be. Just put your mind to it. There's your pharmacist. There's your policemen, there's your educators, there's your, you know, here's your deputy mayor. <laughs> so yeah, thanks Steve for everything you put into that. Alrighty, anything else? Do we have in camera, did you say, Jeff? Uh, I don't have in camera, um, but I did ask if we could have an emergency council meeting to ratify the uh, G ground search and rescue motion. Sure. Sorry, do we have to make an motion to adjourn Committee of the Whole first, and then. Yes. Okay. I'll make the motion to adjourn Committee of the Whole. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we'll call this council meeting to order. Uh, record of attendance, no absent with regrets. There's one item on the agenda, and that is to ratify uh, the motion made in Committee of the Whole with regard to ground search and rescue. Okay. Moved by Councillor Lesser. Second. Okay. By Councillor Dares. Any discussion? Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Contrary. Motion carried. Motion to adjourn. Second. Thanks.